Okay guys, uh, welcome to the second video in our series on glaciers. In the last video we learned a little bit about how glaciers work, how they accumulate snow, how they melt out snow, and importantly how they flow like rivers. And what we haven't talked about is as that ice flows it has an incredible erosive potential. It's able to grind up rocks in the valley below it, pluck boulders, and carry everything along in this stream of ice. And of course at the downstream end of a glacier we've got a lot of ice water melting out creating huge powerful rivers that can flush all this debris out past the tip of the glacier and into a lake or ocean or valley wherever you are. So as a result of all this flowing and erosion and meltwater Glaciers are incredibly important in landscape evolution. They always leave a mark wherever they've been, and that quote-unquote mark defines the landscape around us. It determines where you can build your house, where you can put your septic system, uh, where you could build a bridge over a river. So by defining the kind of landscape, glaciers have defined our entire infrastructure reality. Um, and they're really, really important. So in this video, we'll look at some erosional glacial features, then we'll look at some depositional glacial features, and then we'll finish with a section on glacial landscapes of the Champlain Valley, where we'll talk about how glaciers have influenced our immediate surroundings here in Middlebury, and also start to prepare you for what you might see on some of our field trips coming up. So the biggest point about glaciers, I, I always want you to remember, what they do is they move mass from on land into the offshore. They are erosion machines. They grind up the rock and they flush it out into oceans and lakes. And this is hugely important in the big picture. Glaciers can tear down entire mountain ranges in you know the scope of hundreds of thousands of years to a million years and flush that all out to sea. So they have this really important role in the big picture of erosion. And that erosion leaves a mark, as I said. Um, here's a cartoon showing some classic features from an, an alpine glacier setting, or a valley glacier. Um, one of the things we've got is a U-shaped valley where that ice lobe had come down and carved out uh, the U-shape and widened the valley uh, wider than it should be based just on the river that, that's sitting there. And uh, of course that glacier then melts back. It leaves these beautiful hanging gut valleys where there used to be other smaller glaciers coming in and contributing. And often you'll get beautiful waterfalls coming out of those hanging valleys like we see in Yosemite National Park and many other places. And then up in the high country, you'll often find these cirques or bowls where glaciers uh, were accumulating snow and ice and kind of directly eroding back against the ridge line to create these bowls that are called cirques. And a lot of time those cirques will have little lakes sitting at their foot called tarn lakes or tarns. Um, often these lakes will be contained in by a little glacial moraine or something like that. So if you ever go backpacking in the Rockies or the Sierras or the Cascades, you won't go far without coming into a valley where you see this exact setting. A beautiful lake sitting at the base of a cirque below some triangular shaped peak called a horn that's been eroded by glaciers on all sides. And of course, a lot of times we'll see these knife ridges as well between the valleys or arets. So that's very typical glaciated terrain. Um, and just to put that in perspective, here's a, a photo from the high Sierra Nevada of California. You can see I'm not making any of this stuff up. We've got all of our horn shaped peaks. We've got our cirques. Some of these have little residual glaciers in them, or at least have snow that won't melt in the summer, permanent snow fields. We've got our little tarn lakes sitting down at the base of the cirques um, and some big broad valleys where, where ice sheets have eroded down. So it makes for beautiful, beautiful mountain landscapes. And here's one more look at that. Here's a, 
looking up, a beautiful U-shaped valley. Um, you can, see, in this case, still see the glacier hanging up above here. It hasn't retreated all the way back. Um, and one classic sign of a, a glaciated valley is what's called an underfit stream, where you've got some kind of semi-pathetic little stream running through that could never really have eroded this whole huge valley. Um, so it's underfit. The stream is undersized for the valley. That's how you know there must have been a glacier here doing the big work. So those are some classic erosional features. Um, let's look now at some depositional features. So all this eroded material has got to go somewhere and uh, it's going to be sediment and that sediment is going to be deposited somewhere. So one of the classic types of uh, depositional uh, glacier deposits is called glacial till. And we've talked about this once already. Here it is again. It's a very poorly sorted uh, diamict made of very large boulders in a matrix of very fine sand or even mud and clay. And it's poorly sorted because the glacier just plowed it up. There was no water involved in the deposition. And in many cases, the glaciers just plucked these boulders right out of the upstream valleys that we just saw and pushed them out uh, in the ice. And then as the ice melts out, these things get deposited in what are called moraines. So these moraines are made of glacial till. You can think of them as bulldozer piles where the till gets bulldozed up. It's very common we'll have a lateral moraine going right along the edge of the glacier. And you have to keep in mind here, this glacier ice is retreating now. It was once probably two or three times thicker. So the ice would have once gone right up to the edge of this moraine, right? Or even over the top of it. And then we've got the end moraine down here, and, and we've got the modern drainage river coming out of the tongue of the glacier and carrying that meltwater through this debris field. So that's pretty typical. And you'll often see moraines even after the ice is long gone. Here's an example of that. Uh, this is a shot from Durango, Colorado. And you can see this nice river here and a whole series of beautiful glacial moraines. One here, one here, and then what looks to be possibly even a bigger, older one right out here on the outside. But definitely these two represent two specific glacial advances when the ice sheet pushed down, piled up this material, and then retreated back. So another depositional feature is called a glacial outwash deposit. And these are uh, extensive deposits of sand and gravel, usually deposited by a high energy braided river, such as the one we're seeing here coming off the Vatnajökull ice cap in Iceland. And this river can move around and spray sediment all across this plain, uh, filling it in with sand and gravel. It can push this sand and gravel many miles from the tip of the glacier. So it's quite common that uh, valleys, like for example the Champlain Valley, where we live, will contain a lot of sand and gravel that's basically deposited by river systems that often are running right along the edge of the ice sheet uh, between the ice sheet and the mountain or being flushed off the tip of the ice. So another type of uh, deposit is uh, basically lacustrine clays. And these clays, I guess I'll first go to what they look like. Uh, so lacustrine clays are often uh, nicely bedded units of clay and silt. Um, and they're deposited in very deep, calm water where we cannot carry the coarser sediment, but where the fine clays can actually settle out. They're very well sorted usually. So usually we're looking just at very well sorted fine sediments, although you can have some coarser beds. So these lacustrine silts and clays are quite common and they're usually deposited in what are called uh, paraglacial lakes. So these are lakes that form right at the edge of the ice sheet. As the ice is pulling back, uh, it will temporarily block outlet rivers or outlet canyons and actually trap lakes up behind the ice. 
So here's one here. Here's another one here. This lake wants to drain this way down some pre-existing channel, but the ice tongue is blocking it from draining, okay? So as these ice sheets pull back, we usually get complicated multiple generations of lakes. So we see these lakes here today, but in a few years, this ice will move and these lakes will drain, but it may well dam up a lake in a slightly different geometry somewhere else. So these lakes tend to be transient but they're really important because there's a lot of sediment in them and that sediment can deposit thick layers of clay and silt onto the landscape. And so in many cases, like in the Champlain Valley, these lakes were actually the last thing to cover our landscape. So the glaciers were long gone, but these, gla these lakes were still here. We'll look at that in a second, actually right now. So we'll segue now into glacial landscapes of the Champlain Valley. And to think about this, we have to first understand that all of northern North America was covered by a single ice sheet. Well, a couple ice sheets that had merged together. In our case, um, we were covered by the Laurentide ice sheet. And it existed from about 96,000 to 14,000 years ago. So we were covered by this thing for about 80,000 years that Vermont spent under the ice. And that's not very long ago. Um, and the ice was very thick, um, as much as three kilometers as, as it's at its peak. You know, likely here in Vermont, we would have had at least a couple kilometers over us. So for perspective, that's like a mile and a half of ice, um, or roughly two or three times the height of our highest peaks, like Mount Washington. So a lot of ice way above us. Importantly, sea level was also way lower all the water was bound up in this ice, so sea level was about 100 meters lower, which actually means that the edge of our continent was way bigger. Instead of the coastline you know, being here at New Jersey where it is today, it was almost 100 kilometers offshore of New Jersey. So there was a whole bunch of extra coastal real estate that was then flooded as these ice sheets melted. Now, what's also interesting is the termination of these ice sheets down here was right along where Cape Cod is and also Long Island. So if you live in these places, you might know that um, much of the geology here is dominated actually by glacial moraines. This was the farthest extent of that Laurentide ice sheet where it had pushed up all of that debris and deposited those moraines which now stick out just above sea level um, as these nice kind of island places where people like to live. Long Island, Martha's Vineyard, Cape Cod, Nantucket, all at least partially glacial moraines. Now, as that ice sheet retreated, um, we have a pretty good chronology of the time scale. Um, it, it pulled back from Long Island starting around 23,000 years ago and it took it uh, almost 10,000 years to eventually pull back out of the Champlain Valley right through here. So where we live, that ice sheet was melting back at around, um, around 13 to 14,000 years. We were being uncovered by the melting ice. And as that ice sheet retreated, there was a pretty big ice lobe concentrated down in the Champlain Valley here. And as that ice lobe melted, it left us some very specific deposits. One thing we see a lot of is glacial till, these very coarse, boulder-rich layers that we find often in the mountains, but also uh, if you dig down deeper in the valleys, you'll find them down there as well. But another really important feature is sediment that was deposited by rivers running along the edge of this stagnant ice lobe. And these rivers were reworking sediment and depositing it between the ice lobe and the mountain front. So right around where East Middlebury is, for example. And once that ice lobe finally melted, <coughs> it left behind what are called came terraces. These are flat benches of river sediment uh, right up against the mountain flank where those rivers were running along and depositing that material then the ice melts, 
and this terrace is now kind of perched up at a higher elevation than the valley floor. And here's just an example of some of those meltwater streams coming along the Greenland ice cap, just to give you some perspective on, on just how big these rivers can be that are actually running right along the top of, of the ice sheet. And here's an example of some of the deposits. This is Highway 125 coming up towards East Middlebury and then up towards the Snow Bowl. And right as you uh, come across the Middlebury River for the first time and you head up towards the Snow Bowl, up this steep hill, you're, you're basically driving through these came terraces. And you can actually see all these uh, evidence of channels flowing south right along here and then channels flowing south through here. <clears throat> so the ice sheet was covering this whole area, and then these are came terraces deposited between the, the ice lobe and the mountain front. And uh, it, we'll learn in the groundwater piece of this class that that's actually where Middlebury's groundwater comes from, or its, its municipal water supply comes from these, these sediment deposits. So that's a good example of why <laughs> The legacy of these glaciers is so important to us. All the water we're drinking is filtered through these glacial deposits. And of course, um, we also had a glacial lake here in the Champlain Valley. Uh, as the ice lobe retreated back, um, this was the ice margin. We had a lot of these ice dam lakes sitting up against it, including uh, a very large lake here in the Champlain Valley. This was called Lake Vermont. And what happened is the northern exit of the Champlain Valley was plugged by a big ice lobe. And it actually dammed up water all into the valley. And this lake was overflowing to the south, actually at that time, overflowing down through Whitehall and down through the Hudson River, down to New York City. So we had this huge oversized lake called Lake Vermont. Um, and within that lake, we deposited a lot of thick sediments and clays. And a good testament to that is what's called the Bristol Delta. This is um, right where the town of Bristol sits. It's actually built entirely on a delta deposit. And this delta was literally where the New Haven River actually met Lake Vermont. And as the river lost its energy, it dropped its sedimentary load and built up this huge flat delta right into Lake Vermont. Now, of course, today that Lake Vermont is long gone, and, but we still have the delta. Here it is, this huge flat area with a kind of steep edge. You can see people are quarrying sand and gravel out of the, the far edge of the delta. But basic, and the New Haven River here has come and actually easily cut down into those sands and flushed some of them away. But basically, most of the town is still built on this, this delta that was deposited into this glacial lake. Now, at lower elevations in the Champlain Valley, much of the floor is covered with clay and silt, also associated with the deeper parts of Lake Vermont. And it's not too uncommon that we see big, bad landslides happening in the clay uh, where that weak clay just fails right out from under a house um, and, and also presents uh, hazards and problems for agriculture, too. So in summary, we looked at erosional glacial features, depositional glacial features, and also glacial landscapes of the Champlain Valley. I'll leave you with a concept question, a link to the quiz, and we'll see you after spring break, where we'll take off on uh, mountain building and metamorphism. Thanks a lot.